It would help if I turned up my mic at all. Oh. <laughs> all right, let's get this show on the road. So hello and welcome. My name is Brendan. This is... Oh, sorry. Messed up my intro. It's been a while since I've done that. All right. Hello and welcome to Accident Origin, your weekly writing web show. My name is Brendan. This is my show. How's it going, guys? What are you up to? What's going on? How's the audio? Is it good? Is it too loud? Too quiet? Let me know. Let me know. I will fix it. Just waiting for the delay to catch up for a sec there. Okay. Uh, so a couple things before we get into today. Um, last week on Monday, we started uh, the other show here on Accidental Origin uh, called Rewrite. It's a bi-weekly book club. So every second week, uh, we do an episode. So last week, we did an episode. Next week, we're doing an episode on the 20th, March 20th. Uh, the first book we read, or we read the first half of The Last Wish by Andre Sapowski. Uh, the second episode is going to be the second half of this book. Um, this is the first book in the Witcher series. I think it went pretty well. Uh, there's a little bit, there's always a little bit of learning curve when you're doing something different and new uh, like that. Um, yeah, we had like sort of a. <laughs> A slow start, but it ramped up as the show went on. But I enjoyed it. It was good. It was a good time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly, Sam. The last half of The Last Wish, the first book of the Witcher series. It's it's kind of it's kind of the other one was even harder. I was writing descriptions for the YouTube channel and all that, which you can see down in the description below here, underneath my channel. There's a bar. But it's like the first episode of Read Write, where we read the first half of The Last Wish, <laughs> the first book of the Witcher series. Like Jesus, so many, so many firsts and lasts. <laughs> but yeah, oh, yeah, uh, so that is available as a podcast. So you can download it and listen to it on your own time. Uh, so you don't have to tune into the episodes of that, but there's also the YouTube and all that. And I think that show translates pretty well to sort of a more VOD style of uh, consumption because of the nature of it. So, yeah. Okay. So this week... We are going to be doing, uh, I want to say something a little different, but I don't know if it's actually all that different from what I usually do. It depends. Um, I have a tendency to do a lot of, uh, like pseudo spontaneous things <laughs> when it comes to the show. Um, so I was talking to Sam last night and I was like, Hey, so like, what do you think I should do on the show? tomorrow he's like throwing around some options and eventually he made a suggestion and I think that suggestion was very good um, so we're going to try to do it but I don't have a ton of ideas <laughs> right this second which is okay I mean that's kind of again part of the process and if there's anything that we're about on accidental origin it's showing the process 
showing us that. Yeah, you guys get what I'm saying. <laughs> Do people tell you that? That's good. I'm <laughs> That's good. So yeah, um, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be talking about this. Just trying to formulate my thoughts. <laughs> rather than just keep talking. Uh, so, uh, if you haven't heard me talk about it before, there's a site called Duotrope. It's a great site if you want to submit stuff to magazines because uh, it has a lot of, uh, sort of a general repository of magazines where you can, it has basic uh, submission guidelines and all that. You should always go to the publication's website to find out the specifics. Um, that's always a good call. But it kind of gives you a list and it helps you keep track of your submissions to places. Uh, I started using it when I started submitting to magazines recently. Uh, I really like it. I know Sam uses it. Um, yeah, very good stuff. So like 60 bucks a year, uh, which I think is well worth the, the price for what it does. But one of the other things it, it does is it has this sort of interview with an editor thing. Uh, so this actually, this interview, these interviews with the editors has, um, I'll get to that in a sec, Sam has a lot more information about what the publication is kind of looking for. I really like it. And this information is actually freely available. Uh, it's really only the submission stuff and some of the other things like statistics and all that. Um, well, this one has some. Is that because I'm logged in? Am I logged in? Yeah, I'm logged in. That's why. <laughs> I was going to say. So anyway, the whole point of this is that there's a really, um, uh, Apex Magazine is a very interesting magazine. Uh, they specialized in like sci-fi, fantasy, horror, um, especially the weird and twisted stuff. And uh, how did I find them? They were part of, some, they were part of something, God. My thought process is all over the place today. Um, what was it? It was the um, Hugo Award for Best semi prosian Was it Hugo? Or was it Nebula? Oh god, why am I Yeah. That's a Hugo Award, right? Yeah, okay. God, man. Forgot what I was talking about for a sec there. Yeah, so they're one of the nominees in the last few years. Um, like, they've been nominated uh, four times in the last five years. I don't know what that is. <laughs> in EGOT? Have they? Or 
this spaceman that you're talking about. Anyway. The point being... I guess the point of all of this is that I really love this description that they have here. Um, and so I kind of wanted to push my writing. A lot of the stuff I do on Accidental Origin is fairly safe. It's very basic. I do it as practice stuff. And I thought it might, well, Sam's suggestion, uh, I thought it might be a good idea to kind of push uh, my own boundaries a bit and uh, and do some more dark speculative writing uh, push it further you know so I'm going to read off this description because I think it's great and so you guys kind of have a reference if you're not glued to the screen but uh, says here We do, want, we do not want hackneyed, hackneyed, cliche plots or neat, tidy stories that take no risk. We do not want idea stories without character development or prose style, nor do we want derivative fantasy with Tolkien serial numbers filed off. What we want is sheer, unvarnished awesomeness. We want the stories it scared you to write. We want stories full of marrow and passion, stories that are twisted, strange and beautiful we want science fiction fantasy horror and mashups of all three the dark weird stuff down at the bottom of your little literary heart these this magazine is not a publication credit it is a place to put your secret places and dreams on display just so long as they have a dark speculative fiction element we aren't here for the quote quoted in quoted in here we go if I can pronounce things. Keep in mind that the search for awesome stories is as, diff is as difficult as writing them. If you are rejected, don't get angry. Instead, become more awesome. Write something better and better until we have to accept you because we have been laid low by your tail. It really is that simple. And uh, when we were talking yesterday, Sam made a good point in that, you know, their description is what they're looking for. It's about that sort of deep delve, that push for more. Dig deeper within yourself to get something really and truly unique. So, we're going to attempt that today. And I have no idea if we're going to succeed. Um, but yeah, we're going to try it. Um, cause I think it's important. I think, I think pushing yourself as an artist, as a creative person is an important part of what it means to be a creative person. Um, you know, if we always just stay in our safe bubble, we, we will never get better at what we do. So yeah, what do you guys think? What do you guys think about <laughs> what I'm trying to do today? And as always, I mean, feel like uh, Nightbot just, just threw it up there, but you know, feel free to ask questions. Ask me what I'm doing. Ask, ask me if something is unclear. Um, I'm happy to answer all of your questions. I'm happy to talk about um, what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and, and all that stuff. I mean, we're all here to learn, right? Myself as well. I'm nowhere near perfect. <laughs> and that won't be changing anytime soon.
So, thoughts that I have. Let's do some brainstorming. Let's, uh, let's do some things. Let's figure this out. So thoughts. I find it interesting that they. Um... Oh, and part of this is like. Part of uh, why this is actually a really good thing to practice right now, is it kind of gets you in the habit of thinking about what a magazine is looking for, what. Um... Like what? Are, what are they looking for? What are you trying to do? Um... God, that sentence made no sense. What I mean to say is it's it's about, you know, like f knowing what your market is, knowing where you're going to publish something, where you're going to submit something for publishing and how well it fits to what they're trying to do. Um, and recognizing those elements. So one of the things that I think is really interesting about this magazine is that they specifically mention mashing up sci-fi, fantasy, and horror. Which is really interesting to me. So there's definitely that. Um, what else? What other things do I think? I'm just going to move this over to the other window so I can see it. Um, dark. Dark. It's always interesting, and there's a lot of ways we can interpret dark as a genre or as a style, I guess. Uh, the most apparent one to, to me always is film noir, that sort of grit and uh, pulp sort of style action. Uh, dark also means a lot of um, uh, night. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna make, make some notes, things I'm thinking. Uh, night, uh, vampires, supernatural creatures, that sort of thing. Um, dark can also mean uh, twisted, so things that are messed up. Um, what else? Uh, they like risks. Risk is always an interesting thing. It means they're looking for more experimental stuff. It means they're looking for stuff that lays bare the soul of the writer. So in a lot of ways, to me, that, that reads like it should be very personal writing. Um, things that are passionate, um, strange, beautiful. You know, secret places, dreams. Hmm. What else? And feel free to sh throw out some suggestions, guys. Like, I'm perfectly willing to entertain them, as it were.
So, what are things that I think kind of inspire these sort of elements? Um, when I was talking there, some of the things that came to mind were um, Guillermo del Toro in general, but more specifically things like Hellboy 2. And the strain. Um, what else? Uh, I guess Pan's Labyrinth to a certain extent is pretty dark. If I could spell, which I can't. So, you know, it is what it is. Um,. Yeah, and then to a certain extent, um, Jim Henson. Talk about things like uh, the Dark Crystal. And uh, what was the other thing I was thinking of by Jim Henson? There was something else that I thought was really interesting. There was something else I was thinking of, and it wasn't Farscape. Um, man. What am I thinking of? Oh, Labyrinth. <laughs> Probably. I'm pretty sure that's what I was th thinking of. Because that's pretty dark. Um... I think there was something else too. I'm looking at the uh, Jim Henson's IMDb right now. Hmm. Yeah, the Dark Crystal for sure. For sure. Yeah, that's all I got at the moment, is those two. Um, of course, one of my favorite writers of all time, Jorge Dewey Bojes, all about that darkness and twisted. All about labyrinths. I'm starting to see a common theme here. Um, and then I'm reminded of something, a blurb. Um, oh, H.P. Lovecraft, of course. Can't, can't do twisted like H.P. Lovecraft. Um, I'm reminded of a blurb. So this blurb, and I think there might be another one.
Yeah, so I have two blurbs here, and they're actually related. Let's go back to my thing here. Back to this. So I have here um, Scott McCloud's The Sculptor. Uh, see there, the best graphic novel I've read in years, Neil Gaiman. I'm a huge fan of Scott McCloud. If you haven't heard me talk about Scott McCloud before, I will do so now, uh, briefly. And then I have here Brian Lee O'Malley's Seconds, a graphic novel. Brian Lee O'Malley being the guy who wrote uh, Scott Pilgrim, which was great, by the way. You should read both the comic and watch the movie. They're both the same premise, but very different in terms of execution. Um, but I like them both. They, they both effectively do a lot of things. <laughs> but yeah. So Scott McCloud is one of my favorite uh, writers ever. Uh, well, famous, famous comic book writers anyway. Uh, he's an independent cartoonist. His most famous piece is uh, a book called Understanding Comics, which I don't actually own at the moment because I've, I've actually owned several copies of it and I keep giving them away to people, uh, which is fine because I, like, I, I just want to spread the love of that book. Uh, so much so I'm cool with that it's just you know I don't actually have a copy for myself right now though I do own his other two books in that series making comics and reinventing comics uh, which are on that shelf right there Let's see if I get my finger yeah right there all right so I, I love Scott McCloud. I have his Zot book, like uh, the complete black and white Zot. So I love the non-color issues of Zot. Um, yeah, I just I love him to death. I think he's a great storyteller. Uh, in a lot of ways, um, Zot is kind of is dark. It explores dark themes within a very bright and pretty world, which I which I kind of love. It takes place in that sort of tomorrow Tomorrowland future. Um, and sort of traveling between today and that future, and it gets it gets deep and dark. Um, so Scott McLeod. So. Uh, the, the reason I wanted to talk about these two blurbs is um, two reasons. So, one, uh, this is the description of the sculptor. A spellbinding urban fable about a childhood wish, a deal with death, the price of art, the value of life, and a desperate love. Um, and I love that description because it invokes so many things. Um... And, and I mean, it's, it's it talks about art. It talks about, you know, death. It talks about love, desperation, value. Like there's lots of really interesting things that I like in that descriptor. Uh, so we got death, art, price, slash value. Desperation. Love. So there's that. Um, plus, the art on the back here is super cool. Look at these calendars with, like, days falling out like they're pitfalls. <laughs> That's so cool. So then... I pulled Brian Lee O'Malley, uh, again, for that sort of cool blurbs on the back here. And funnily enough, though I hadn't realized it, uh, the two blurbs on the back of this book, the first one is from Guillermo del Toro, <laughs> and the second one is from Scott McCloud. <laughs> so it is what it is. Um, but they go as follows. In seconds, Brian Lee O'Malley plays the angst of use against the fabric of a larger epic, in doing so, he enriches both. A great ride, Guillermo del Toro. But here's the one that really, like, strikes home with me. And again, maybe that's just because Scott McCloud is, like, one of my personal heroes. But Brian Lee O'Malley's Seconds is adorable, haunting, 
funny and beautiful. A perfect recipe for a great graphic novel. It's that juxtaposition of adorable and haunting that really, really strike me. So there's that. So that's Scott, Scott McCloud's blurb. <laughs> yeah, and, and you're totally right, Sam. It is, is kind of a swirling circle of, of blurbs. Uh, I think that's because a lot of the people that I like like the things that I like. <laughs> um, you know, like when you buy an HP Lovecraft book, like I own... Yeah, you can see it there. It's it's a little blurry, but it's this book here, the big thick one. That's uh the annotated HP Lovecraft uh with an introduction by another one of my personal heroes, Alan Moore, and a and the person who annotated it is the guy who did the annotated Sandman by Neil Gaiman. <laughs> So there's certainly that, um, and you'll when you see like the Scott McCloud book, like the the blurb on the front is a Neil Gaiman quote. Like, I think the things that I like are just the things that the people I like like as well. You know, like we like similar things, <laughs> as it were. And I think Alan Moore is a great example to put to this list. Um, not his... Uh, not necessarily the more mainstream stuff, though I guess it depends on your definition of mainstream. But I really think of uh, his 2000 AD work. Uh, so like The Ballad of Halo Jones... And DR and Quinch. Also, to a certain extent, uh, V for Vendetta. Um, and From Hell. Which is my personal favorite Alan Moore story. From Hell. And talking about these inspirations, um, I'm going to go back to the screen here so you can see that I added all this stuff. But talking about my inspirations is kind of important to this conversation. Um, again, I'll go back to that description where it talks about, you know, your secret places in dreams. Um, and uh, what else is here? So full of marrow and passion, the bottom of your little literary heart. Secret places and dreams on display. You know? The stories it's scared you to write. And in a lot of ways, these are the people who have influenced me as a writer. These are the people who have touched my soul. Who have pushed what I want as a writer you know, have challenged the way that I think about writing, have challenged the way I think about story, have made those works that resonate you for years to come. Oh, and I'm forgetting, of course, the master mangaka himself, Yashishiro Tatsumi. Everything he does is dark and twisted. Um, and to a certain extent, uh, the later works of um, Osamu Tatsuka. So more specifically, uh, the Ode to Kirihito. Um, yeah, the Ode to Kirihito, MW, uh the Secret Life of Bugs. Uh, is that what it's called?
No, I'm totally wrong. It's uh, Ayako and uh, the Book of Human Insects, which is such a cool title, by the way. So, you know, Tetsuma, or Tetsuka has done a ton of different stuff over the years. Uh, he was super prolific. But these are the books that I really like. These are the books that I own. Um, and they're dark and twisted. MW is about a, um, a guy who was hit by an experimental nerve gas and turned into a serial killer. Um, the Ode to Hirohito is about a man turning into a beast. Uh, the Book of Human Insects is kind of about this weird alienation. Uh, kind of similar to like Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis in a lot of ways, but without the weird transformation. Um, so there's that. Um, Ayako. I remember Ayako. I remember scenes from Ayako. I'm just trying to remember why I picked Ayako. Let's see what we got here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Here's the description for Ayako. Uh, Jiro Tenge, one of the eldest sons of, a mo of the moderately wealthy Tenge family, has become an agent working for the United States, and his secret murders are discovered by Ayako Tenge, his younger sister. The problem is aggravated by her discovery of terrible incestuous affairs in her own family. The wife of her older brother is actually her mother, who has, who has to frequently have sex with Ayako's father, the family patriarch, Sakuman. To hide these secrets, the family, under pressure from Sakuman and his elder son Ichiro, decides to keep Ayako locked up in the basement for the rest of her life. Despite the efforts of her mother and brother, Shiro, she lives for nearly two dozen years under the family's house, while great political and social changes occur above her. Ayako eventually leaves the basement after growing to a beautiful and attractive woman and seeks affection from others while remaining terrified of the outside world. This sets off a chain reaction of events which spells tragedy for the Tenge family. That is dark and twisted. So, what do you guys think? What do you guys think about dark and twisted? What elements do you see within it? Because I'm getting a lot of a lot of sense of, and I'm gonna make a I'm gonna make a brainstorming too here. That's the wrong thing. So, uh, things that uh, I think are very common within within kind of the things that I'm talking about. Uh, labyrinths. That I still can't spell. Yes, I 100% agree, Sam. Uh, some kind of fear. Or strong tension. Powerful uncertainty. Yes, I agree. Uh, I think, and I was just thinking of this before you said it, that a lot of that has to do with unfathomable, unfathomable human nature. Or 
or I guess character nature is more accurate in that we, a lot of that fear is created by us not understanding. Right? You know, fear through alienation. Uh, I think and alienation is actually a great um, topic for that dark and twisted. We often talk as writers about the idea of the outsider, someone who is outside. Um, and this character is great. The outsider is always a great character and it's done a lot. But I think in terms of these dark and twisted things that the outsider, at least from, I think in terms of like Yashishiro Tatsumi's work and all that, like the outsiders is, is all of us. We're all outsiders in our own way. Um, and I think that resounds pretty heavily in his work. And when I say the outsiders, all of us, I don't mean that like we're all outsiders, therefore we should be outsiders together or anything like that. I mean that like everyone feels alienated within and of themselves. And that drives our confusion. It drives that sort of strong tension, powerful uncertainty, and that we don't understand the people around us, but we're afraid of being alone. So we push boundaries. And it doesn't always work. to summarize that. What else? I'm going to I'm going to do about 10 more minutes of brainstorming and then I'm going to take my break. And then when I come back, we're going to start forming this into a story. We're going to start going to take these thematics and, and start influencing uh, a very character driven story. I think anything to do with sort of those secrets and all that have to be have to be a character driven piece. Because plot does not make fear. Character makes fear. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of that uh, has to do if you just trying to, I, I have thousands swirling thoughts. I'm trying to piece together a lot of ideas right now. But yeah, uh, fear can definitely be created from ambiance and situation. And that's kind of where I was going is that uh, fear comes not from the, the uh, 
God. Thinking of that quote from... Why am I blanking? Why am I blanking? Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> wow. That's, uh, that's sad. Yes. Uh, the quote I'm thinking of is, There is no terror in the bang. Only... In the antip and only in the anticipation of it. So I think that that goes with what you're saying, Sam. That you know, ambiance and situation can be create fear for sure. And that an ambiance and situation comes from the plot more than the character. That being said, um, my point was kind of like Oh, here's a good example. So when you're watching an action movie, like a straight action movie, um, like something like Syl Sylvester Stallone did in the 90s. You know, someone pulls a gun on him, we don't really get scared. Because we know that, that A, he's not scared, and B, the character that's facing him isn't particularly scary. But then you put that same situation in a movie where the main, or in a in a story where the main character gets terrified gets absolutely scared of the gun it has more impact it it creates a sort of fear you know <laughs> hey robin how's it going <laughs> yeah that sounds really cool sam spooky spaceman with weird whispers and radio static i love that kind of thing i love scary spaceman <laughs> i really do scary astronauts are the coolest what um there was a really interesting comic book i read uh that was some sort of uh ghost hunter book I think it was called Ghost Hunters. Maybe it wasn't. And one of the coolest characters that they had was they actually had a ghost, uh, a ghost astronaut who followed them around. He has like a burning skull inside a, a ghost thing. Gotta, gotta know. Was that book? I'm trying to remember who it was by.
Metal Gear Solid 3 is the Fury. I came back from space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. It was really neat because he was kind of, um, the astronaut was kind of the muscle of the group in a lot of ways. Uh, and he never spoke. He was just kind of always there. It was great. Um, I mean, it wasn't particularly scary, but that comic wasn't meant to be scary. So, you know, it is what it is, but. I'm just going to find this real quick and then I'm going to take my break. Spooky space, man. Well, actually, I can show you what I'm looking at as well. I might, I might, might as well. I'm just like f flipping through a couple of publishers because I know it wasn't, um, I know it was like either IDW or it was like IDW or Dark Horse or like Boom or Monkey Brain, something like that. It was one of the, the bigger, small publishers. I'm pretty sure. And normally you'd say, well, well, be real. Why don't you just look through your purchases <laughs> to find it? Uh, it's actually because there's so much stuff in there that it's impossible to sort. <laughs> so it, it takes way longer. <laughs> nice. Put these two together. Inspiration images. Astronauts on fire. Oh, you know what? It was, um, it's just coming to me. I think it was the same publisher who did that ridiculous. Um, remember that secret Asian teddy bear comic we were talking about like ages ago. That's probably almost a year ago now, but that comic, it's the same publisher as that. I just got to remember who that was. <laughs> I thought it was image. Maybe it wasn't. Well, image does have a comment called astronauts in trouble. Which sounds hilarious. I just think.
<laughs> exactly, Sam. Exactly. Apparently, it's the series that brought Charlie Adlard, the original artist of, um, or one of the artists of The Walking Dead, to Robert Kirkman's attention. I'll show you the, the thing here as I have it. In 1959, the Channel 7 news team covers a routine homicide that leads them to a m mysterious rocket base in Peru filled with Russian spies. All in a day's work for the most trusted newsmen in America, they couldn't know their day their day and their day would end up with a hot pilot, a fast ship, cheap beer, and spacesuits. <laughs> Sounds great. I'd read that. I wish there was a way to filter out. Sounds like my weekends. <laughs> nice. Nice. Oh, it's by this publisher, for sure. It's by Boom Studios. Okay, cool. That makes things easy. See? I know what I'm talking about. It was one of the bigger, smaller publishers. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Boom, uh, of Boom Studios, by the way. They publish a lot of really good, good stuff. Uh, irredeemable, uh, incorruptible and irredeemable are great. Um, if you haven't read them, you should. Clockwork Angels was really good as well. Oh, look, The Expanse. There's Imagine Agents with our secret agent Terry, teddy bear. Jim Henson stuff. Oh, fair enough. I think it's just like a, like a short tie-in. I don't think it's meant to be anything particularly crazy. It's not here. Hmm. 
can't figure it out. All right, well, I'm gonna take a break, and then when I come back, we're gonna add some more stuff to this. I will say, uh, when I was looking at that stuff, I was thinking of um, uh, gravity in terms of a film. I think gravity is a great, um, such a great dark, like powerful story. And I think it has a lot to do with what we're talking about. Um, so I think, well, if I could speak, the unknown is a huge element of what we're going to be trying to do. Cause it's the unknown that terrifies us. So yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to take i uh, I'm going to take a 10 minute break and I'll be back and we're going to start making the story. Cool. Cool. All right. Break time. <laughs> 